Well, thank you for the welcome. It's good to be here at the Dream Center. Um, you may not know me, but I know you through Pastor Kevin and through Rochelle, a, an amazing ministry couple that I've had the pleasure to get to know over the years. And you know, the first thing that uh, Pastor Kevin, or not really the first thing, the last thing this morning uh, that he messaged me was, oh, by the way, tell them some of your story, which he probably saved till the end because he knows I hate to talk about myself. Um, So I'm not actually going to tell you my story. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Kevin and Norm story because I think that's more illuminating. Uh, I consider Pastor Kevin to be a mentor of mine and also a brother. Uh, Now, when you look, you might say, well, of course those guys would get along because you look at me up here, depending on how good your eyes are, you might think Pastor Kevin's still here because, okay, we're about the same age, right? And we're about the same height and we're about the same size and we're both kind of quiet and reflective and <laughs> why are why are people laughing you're going to edit this out for Kevin right okay so we're not exactly the same all right uh, there are some differences between us but we actually are complete opposites in background pastor Kevin was literally presented a bible in the cradle and raised all his life to believe that he was a child of god and that God has placed humanity at the center of creation to know him. I was raised to believe that humanity is an accident, just a happy accident where some molecules bump together, and here we are, so eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. And I lived that way for many, many years. I tried to find meaning in science. But years went by, and believe me, I dug into science a lot. I was a science guy, and I couldn't find answers that stopped me from laying awake at night. And then I finally had kids, and I thought about the world I was raising my kids in, a world without meaning, without hope, where everything was relative, and there were no rules. And I began to seek, because, you know, God leaves a place in our hearts. There's an empty spot that can't be filled by anything but God. We all have a spiritual need that can't be filled by anything but the Spirit. And so I began to seek out churches. My wife and I uh, began to explore. And in 2001, we surrendered our, our hearts to God. We became followers of Jesus. And I praise God for that day. But God wasn't done then. In 2002, my pastor came up to me and said, we want you to teach children's church me? I'm a rookie. I was an agnostic or an atheist, depending on the day you asked me, just a year and a half ago. I I can't do this. But my pastor knew that if you want to learn something, teach it. There's no better way to learn things than teaching it. So he tapped me on the shoulder. I began to learn. I began to teach. A few years later, I got this crazy idea that maybe God was calling me to ministry. And my pastor said, if you want to go into ministry, don't do it because you want to. Do it because you must. Because there will be tough days. There will be beautiful, blessed days, but there will be tough days. Do it because you must. And so I did enter ministry, which I've been in since 2008. And I'm going to skip forward to the Pastor Kevin part because I need to tell you that you have the most exceptional ministry couple. And I've met a lot of good ones, and maybe they're going to watch this, but you have the most exceptional ministry couple that I have had the pleasure to meet. And I shouldn't start this by crying, but they are just so special and precious to me, and I hope you treasure them. So it happens that I'm ministering in the Saskatchewan district, and uh, it was about six years ago. You know, I knew Pastor Kevin and Rochelle a little bit. Uh, Pastor Kevin had been put in charge of a new team, and I got another one of those taps on the shoulder, just like my pastor previously had tapped me and said, you know, maybe you should start teaching. Well, Pastor Kevin came along and said, I'm putting together this new team, and we're going to go all around to churches all around the district, and we're going to do different things to try to help and bless our churches. Because he knew that for 40 years, I had worked outside the church world and gained experience in business and running organizations, different things I'd done. He thought, that's something we could use in the church. So he tapped me on the shoulder and said, we could use your gifts on our team. And nobody had ever really thought, what are we going to do with this crazy guy who really doesn't know anything about the church who's brand new? Pastor Kevin saw something in me, said, I want you on my team. And so that's how I end up being this big, important wheel, as Tony calls me, which I am not. But that's why I'm an executive presbyter with our district, because Pastor Kevin saw something in me. So my story and Kevin's story that I want to share with you is because at any time, at any age, God can tap any one of us and say, I've got something special for you. Let me tell you, I didn't think at 35 years old I was going to end up a pastor. But you know what? If you look at Gideon's story, 
David's story, Matthew's story. They all had jobs and careers. They didn't think God was going to call them to do something different. But that's what happened. And when God sends someone special into your life, like Pastor Kevin, who gives you a tap on the shoulder, and it's going to happen to some of you maybe. And he says, I see something in you. That's not someone who just wants a job done and is looking to use you. No, God uses people like Pastor Kevin who have insight and spiritual wisdom to call people to new ministries, to new opportunities, because he believes you will be blessed, and he believes people will be blessed by you. That's the call he put on me, and I believe he will put the call on people here in Yorkton as well. If he gives you that tap, I would encourage you to listen and to consider and to pray. Changed my life. I believe it will change yours as well. So that may or may not fulfill what Pastor Kevin wanted me to do, but that's what I'm going to do in terms of telling my story and his story. So today I was told that I could give you a message. My message is called The Mark. We are all aware of branding, are we not? We live in a branded world. Everything has got a mark on it. Try to buy a shirt without a mark. It is so hard. Everything's branded because everybody wants you to know you've got our thing, you've got the real thing. Even your cows are branded. Well, there's not brands anymore, but there's ear tags, right? Go buy a rider hat. It's got a hologram inside of it, doesn't it? Your Nike shoes have a swoosh on them. Your, all your Adidas clothes have three stripes. Everything around us is marked that it's genuine. But what about the things in here, among us, in the church? How are we marked? Is there some mark for us? Is there a mark that we have in common? A way that you can spot us and tell that we're genuine? Now, most people at first glance would say no. I mean, what's the thing on my face? The smile. That's how you can tell a Christian? I've known a few that don't. So maybe there's not an outward sign. But the fact is, Scripture says, if you live a Christian way of life, there is a mark. If you are actually a follower of Jesus, that the people who see you, know you, meet you, will see a mark in your life. It will be clear, it will be evident, it will be unmistakable. Now, it's not a tattoo. It's not a certain kind of uniform that we wear. It's more distinct. It's more beautiful than those things. And even people who know nothing about Jesus, nothing about God, nothing about the faith, know nothing about what church would be about, pick up on this mark. They see that there's something different, something distinctive, and begin to understand there's something that marks you as different, as a genuine follower of Jesus. Now, if you're here today, you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm going to describe this, Mark. I've got great news for you. This doesn't apply for you. You don't have to do this stuff. Our standards don't apply to you. If it sounds like, well, that seems hard, that seems unnatural, that seems like I don't want to do that, no worries for you. You're not a follower of Jesus. You're not expected to do this. But for those of us who've declared that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, And if Jesus says, we're going to show this mark, that's not optional. It's not a nice to. Christianity doesn't have nice to's. Jesus didn't say, well, if you feel like it, right? When we declare Jesus as Lord and Savior, it doesn't mean maybe we're going to follow him in this area, you know, or maybe just the best of us, the big wheels, the Pastor Kevins and the Rochelles are going to show it, and the rest of us humble little people aren't going to show it. No, it's not a nice to. It's a have to for all of us. But if you're outside the church, it doesn't apply to you. But if we're followers of Jesus, then we're going to show these things. But I'd like to remind us, we don't do it on our own. I don't know about you, but I don't have enough goodness to follow Jesus. I don't have enough goodness to mirror Jesus. I don't have enough goodness to be like Jesus. It's impossible for me to do that. It's only when I commit to following Jesus that I can leave self-help behind. I spent 35 years on self-help. Lots of people said I was nice. Lots of people said I was a jerk. But when I opened myself up to God's help, then things really changed. I began to live a new and transformed life. That's what the Apostle Paul described in his letter to the Romans. He said, do not conform. This is Romans 12 too. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you follow Jesus, you actually become a new creation. I don't have a slide for this, but 2 Corinthians 5 says this. You become a new creation. And when you open up to his Holy Spirit, your mind is actually transformed as you live in pursuit of Jesus. 
And that's when the mark arrives. It's indelible. It's unmistakable. It's unerasable. Jesus puts his mark in you. And it begins to appear. It begins to show in everyone around you. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So what is this mark? Some of you already know. Right? I, tr I try to hold things back to make it interesting, keep you awake for the start of the message. But you know, what is the mark of a transformed, renewed person? It's a little four-letter word. Not that word. It's a good four-letter word. It shows up 700 times in the English scriptures. It's love. Yes, of course it's love. The mark of a Christian is love. L-O-V-E, love. And the mark I want to share with you today is actually made up of four specific loves. Jesus says, you will see these loves in my people. Jesus expects to see these loves in us and that everyone who sees us will see these loves in us. And they will mark us as genuine followers of Jesus. So let's start with the basics. Why would you follow Jesus? Well, my grandparents did. That's not much of an answer. My mother said I had to or I'd have to eat turnips. That's a better answer because who wants to eat turnips? But that's not a good answer. But literally this question is asked all around the world. Why do you people follow Jesus? It comes at a cost, right? It's social cost, economic cost, sometimes physical danger. Why do you follow Jesus? The only good answer is love. Only love could motivate us to pay the price. And Jesus knew that. He was asked, what's the most important thing God would want from any human being? I'm paraphrasing here, but they came to him and said, what is the most important thing God could want? Matthew chapter 22, starting at verse 37, Jesus said, love the Lord your God. That's the most important thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And in a fit of originality in the church, we call this the great commandment. There's nothing wrong with copying Jesus, I say. He said it's the greatest commandment. We call it the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the biggest and most important love. Now, I'm including this as one of four, but the truth is when you talk about this verse, you could spend a month on ver this verse. There is no mark without this verse. You have to love God, love Jesus, love the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm a Generation X, or okay? I grew up in a Canada where Christianity was part of the culture. Now, it doesn't mean everybody practiced Christianity, but everybody knew the lingo. So I grew up knowing about God, but I didn't know that you could know God. Nobody ever told me. Nobody told me that God wanted to know me. God wanted to hear from me that the creator of the universe wanted a connection with me. He wanted to hear from me. What in the world would I have to say to God? But the truth is, that's what God wants. Not only does God want to hear from you, but God is then going to respond to you. And he responds in so many beautiful ways. And if there's anyone here who didn't know that, surprise, the creator wants to touch your heart. He wants you to reach out to him and he will touch your heart. In fact, he is seeking your heart right now. And if you have never known that, we're going to talk at the end of the service today about reaching back out and allowing God to touch you. Now, when we talk about this love Jesus calls us to, I don't want to be too geeky. Some of you know this, some of you don't. But we should discuss, when Jesus says love, what does he mean? Because in English, we have one word for love. It's so confusing. Say, I love peanut butter. I love my wife. Same word. Does it mean the same thing? I hope not. For your sake, okay? I love baseball. I love my kids. Hopefully, not the same for the sake of your children. Okay? We just have the one word. But this word Jesus says when he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, is a word agapeo, which is a special kind of love. Greeks have lots of words for love. There's a kind for loving your wife, which is very different from loving your baseball game. Very different. And you can know right away one does not fit with the other. But agapeo is a kind of love that is selfless, that puts myself second, it's a kind of love that exalts the one that you love. It's sacrificial. It's generous love. And Jesus says, that's the love that marks you as one of my followers. That's the love that you love God, Father, Son, and Spirit with. That is the love that marks one of his people. So that's the first kind of love that marks us to love. 
our God that way, with agapeo, uplifting love. The second love is very much like it. John chapter 13. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So Jesus is giving this command to disciples, which means his followers, which means the church. I want you, the church, to love one another. So this is Jesus speaking, the Son of God, who is one with God. He came to earth to show us God's personality, God's loving ways with us, right? He came in the flesh and served us so we could know him, see God's heart. And he said, see all of this that I did for you, giving up the glories of heaven and coming and living here in this mud with you people, this way that I have loved you, that's how you love the people in the church with you. I did the agapeo thing. I came down here and I put you first and I sacrificed myself. And now you, my friends, just do what I did. That's not a high calling, is it? Doesn't sound very difficult. No, it's a crazy high calling. But Jesus said, that's what I'm putting in your hearts. That's going to be your brand, church. That's your mark. And yeah, you're going to stand out. You're going to be a little different from the people around you. Because in my church, you're not going to be clawing and tearing and demanding what's mine because you're going to be so busy loving and supporting and boosting each other. Amen? That's a trick. Whenever the pastor says amen, that means I don't think you're with me, but you know you're supposed to be. It's the guilt word. Amen. Right? So you're supposed to say amen back. But what does amen actually mean? Anybody? Amen actually means so be it. So be it. But is it? Is that how it works in our churches? Do we actually put each other first with agapeo love where your need is more important than mine? Is there anyone in the room who loves country music? Okay, we got a couple. Great. What if we did a survey and discovered that 95% of Yorkton loves country music? And so the church leadership announced next Sunday, we are converting all our praise and worship to country because 95% of Yorkton loves country. That's how we're going to reach our community. So, of course, everyone in the church would stand up and say, amen. So be it. I think that's a wonderful idea for outreach. Nobody would leave the church, right? No one would complain that I'm never going to hear another hymn because those aren't country. No one would complain that those lovely songs that the kids sang, and wasn't that delightful? No one would complain I don't get to hear those songs because they're not country, because I'm going to love the people around me, and that's what matters, right? Nobody's going to have a problem with that. Or maybe it would be an issue. Because maybe sometimes we put ourselves first. But Jesus said, I came, I put you first, I want you to put others first. Now this probably didn't happen to you, but we found out just how well we do at putting others first during this little, we had a little virus thing go on that affected some of our other communities in Saskatchewan, probably didn't affect you here in Yorkton. But down where I live next to the capital city, we had a lot of big problems with that virus. A lot of our churches, we lost sight of the call to love one another. And we got so focused on how we all thought that the church should respond. A lot of our churches lost members, got divided, got split. We lost sight of agapeo. We lost sight of putting others first because we wanted things done my way and forgot what true followers of Jesus acted like, are supposed to act like. If Jesus gave his very life for us, can we give up some conveniences for Jesus? for each other? Can we go have some preferences for each other? I pray that we could say amen in our hearts to that. And where we don't say yes, I pray we are transformed by the Holy Spirit so that we can love better than we have. Amen? So love each other. It sounds so good. I want to shout amen. But then doing it can be hard, right, in practice? And in church, we have in common that we love Jesus. But then Jesus threw down another love he wants that's even harder. Oh, thank you, Lord. I love a good challenge. You know, we mentioned the great commandment, right? Well, there's a second part because Jesus is so generous. They said, Jesus, what's the one most important thing in the whole wide world we could ever do? I'm paraphrasing. You won't find that in any translation. Jesus gave us two most important things in the whole wide world. 
Matthew chapter 22, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then the bonus content from Jesus, verse 39. And the second is like it, meaning just as great, just as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean exactly? Who is it? Many churches over the years have tried to shrink that definition of neighbor as small as we can. The problem is Jesus told a story right after this to make it as big as possible. So that the definition of neighbor is all the people who don't love Jesus. We're supposed to have the same incredible love for them as we do for the people inside our church. But, but we have nothing in common with those people. They never did anything for us. And we're supposed to love them anyway, just like Jesus did. I don't know. There's, there's a thing there that says Jesus went pretty far for them. We have a thing where we like to love people in theory, but in practice, it's not a lot of fun because they're different. So quite often, we've got a lot of churches. I know it wouldn't be the same here at the Dream Center, but in a lot of our churches, we can love them in here where it's safe and clean and tidy, and we're not touching anyone who's messy. Or we can love them at home on the couch, think nice things about those poor, messy, broken people, but only in my safe Christian bubble because I don't want to touch them or get touched by them. I don't want to see that brokenness. I don't want them to get their messy stuff on my family. But if Jesus says, love them, is that the same as say nice things about them, toss the odd prayer off? Is that the same as loving? Can you, can you love somebody you don't know? never talked to, don't have a relationship with. We were challenged last year in our church to think about our neighbors. Just start with our neighborhood. All of us have neighbors. Now, if you're in the country, your neighbors are far, farther away than mine. But think about the neighbors that live in the houses around you, on your left, on your right, in front, in back. How many of those folks can you name? Can you name your neighbors? Can you name your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's kids? How much do you know about your neighbors? If you don't know who they are, can you possibly be loving them? But Jesus says this love is as important as loving him and loving the people in your church. That means it's a mark of being a follower of Jesus. So if you're here as a non-follower of Jesus right now, you're saying, Whew, I'm glad this stuff doesn't cover me. Wow, this is crazy. But you know, we struggle to love the people in our group no wonder we struggle to love the people outside. But there's still one more, because that's only three loves. There's a fourth love that marks the followers of Jesus. There's another group we have to raise up, put on a pedestal, treat as more important than ourselves, and it's even harder. Yeah, crazy, I know. Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Enemies. Well, the easiest way to get rid of this one is just say, I don't have any enemies. <laughs> I'm a good person. I don't have any enemies. I love everybody. Well, good for you. Can I please see your social media? I would just want to double check that. Make sure you don't have any, okay? Or, or maybe I can listen to your coffee conversations or your water cooler talk work for a little while. Are you seriously telling me there is no person and no group whose positions and statements don't kind of get your temperature up, don't make your blood boil, don't get your blood pressure going? Congratulations, Saint, fill in the blank. If you do, most of us, though, have those people. So what most of us as followers, just followers tr of Jesus try to do is we paper this over, right? We'll, we'll condemn people's behavior, our enemies, using holy terms. So we'll put them down for their non-Christian behavior because that's okay, right? You know, it, it's the evil thing they're doing. Um, should you be surprised when non-Christians do non-Christian things? Does God need your help identifying that that is a bad idea? Or do you think God has the God part covered? Maybe God has the God part covered and he wants us to do the church part because it seems to me reading the scripture that he's assigned us the church part that the followers of Jesus are supposed to, as his church, be his hands and feet. And the part he assigned to us is loving those people, loving them with agapeo, uplifting them, doing good for them, blessing them, praying for them. I still remember when I encountered this craziness. I wasn't a Christian yet, but I worked with a Christian. 
and we were chatting one morning at work. We were working at the airport, and a plane hadn't come in yet. We're talking. He talk this guy talked about his enemy, someone that he couldn't stand. They were rivals for a young woman's affections. So basically, he wanted this guy dead. But he was talking about this young man, and he said, I hate him, but I'm praying for him every day that things will go well for him, that he will be healthy. And I looked at him like he had three heads. Pardon me? He said, he's my enemy, so I have to love him and bless him and pray for him. So I'm going to do it every day until my heart changes. That was my first encounter with agapeo. Love as a verb, love carried into action. He was committed that he was going to keep loving this man until God renewed his mind and changed it so that he really could love his enemy. Let's be honest, folks. We live in a fractured society. People want you to have enemies. The loudest voices in our society tell you that anyone who thinks differently from you on any important issue is your enemy. Pick the issue. Sexuality, drug policy, climate, indigenous rights, what political party to vote for. If anybody thinks different from you, they're your enemy. You have nothing in common, zero. If it's a little bit different, nothing. You will never find common ground. You can't be civil to those people. It would be a horrendous compromise of everything you believe in. If you ever sat down and had a decent conversation with them, let alone tried to understand them. And that kind of thinking drives more and more people to just live in their little silo, their little echo chamber where the only voice I listen to is the one that agrees with me. And that's why we don't have a vibrant, colorful society. Because the only voices we want to hear are the ones that reinforce our opinions. That's the only thing we'll listen to. But I can tell you as a pastor, as a teacher, as a member of the Church of Christ, that's not what Jesus expects. I can confidently say that Jesus wasn't kidding when he said, when you find somebody on the other side, bless them. If they curse you, bless them. Pray for those who mistreat you. Love your enemies. Do good for those who hate you. Don't go looking for enemies. Go looking for people that God wants to bless. Two years ago, middle of the pandemic, I was told after Sunday service, there was a woman who wanted to see me in my office. I recognized her face because years before, we had worked at the same company for a brief period of time. She was having a relationship crisis. She was broke into tears as soon as I came in the office. She didn't know who to go to. Her common law partner, which was another woman, had stopped supporting her financially. She was the stay-at-home partner. The other one had a job. So she was stuck at home with their child and had no money. It was a nasty situation. She didn't know where to go, but she knew that I was ministering nearby and wondered if there was anything I could, go, I could do to help. She just broke down sobbed in my office. I don't suppose you'd even help a person like me, Angie said, not her real name, by the way. Now, Angie could be considered my enemy because she's part of a community. Some of the people in that community have said pretty rotten things about the church, done some pretty rotten things to the church. But if I'm honest, people in my community have said some pretty rotten things about Angie and her friends and done some pretty rotten things to Angie and her friends. So there's a certain viewpoint that says we're enemies get out, we'll never have anything in common. And I'm not perfect. Sometimes I have some problems relating to people in Angie's community, but I am a follower of Jesus, and I know that I am called to love Angie. So I listened to Angie, and she talked, and she cried, and we helped, and we gave her resources, and I prayed with her, and I gave her ways to get groceries and gas, and talked about further supports. And I gave her my card. And I prayed some more with her. And I begged her to come back later. Now it turns out we're such a small church that she was afraid to come back and be identified. But I found out through a friend that she connected with a bigger church where co she could be more anonymous. I don't know where she's walking today, but I know she turned to the people of God for help in a time of crisis. And people ask me, what would you have done if she came back to your church? Well, I'd thank God. What if she reconciled with her partner and baby and they all came to church? I'd thank God. What is the best place for a person whose life is taking them away from God? Gathered with God's church, hearing his word. Isn't that the best place for them to be? In a place where God's love is celebrated? 
Of course, it's going to be a little messy and a little awkward, but when I read my New Testament, it was messy and awkward all the time. Instead of thinking people of our enemies that we need to hate, let's listen to Jesus and say, love them. Let's get them into our service. Let's get them connected to Jesus' followers, people that love Jesus, so they can see what love really is. Let's let the outside world write people off, and let's never, ever do that as the church. All we have to do is hear people. When Jesus came, he heard people, every kind of people. And let's see people, because Jesus saw people. He really, really saw them, every kind of people. So let's see and hear and engage with people. Because all those people people want to label as enemies, Jesus loves them with a deep and passionate agape love. He went up on that cross for them so that they could have a future. And he charged us, his church, to take his love to them. Amen? So now before I wrap up, I just want to make sure I haven't left things the wrong way. Because scripture says we have to love God our church, our neighbor, and our enemy. You know, Pastor, you've pointed out sometimes we don't live up to that. You seem to be calling us to do better, but you said being the church of Jesus Christ isn't self-help. I think you're telling me to pull up my socks. So if it sounds like I'm telling you to pull up your socks, I apologize. I just want to clarify that's not what I'm saying. Can the church do better? Yes, but not on our own. Not in our power, not by trying harder. If there's an opportunity for us, if we are not loving our church, our neighbor, or our enemy as much, as well as we could, it's not because we've failed in our efforts. It's not because we don't have enough willpower. It's not because we have a love deficit in our heart. It's because we haven't focused our love where we should, where Jesus called us. Because our very first love is our most important. It's what transforms our mind. We must love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And then the other loves begin to manifest in our lives as Jesus renews our minds. If you're a follower of Jesus and these words have resonated with you, but you say, I don't think I'm loving as I should. That's the Holy Spirit calling you back to the greatest love saying, you've got to focus more on loving God. Examine the voices you've been listening to. Think about where you've investing your time and give more of your heart, soul, and mind to loving God. And those other loves will flow as your mind is transformed by the Holy Spirit. And if you're with us today and you're not a follower of Jesus, yet this call to love is speaking to you, that's the Holy Spirit. That's not me, trust me. That's the Holy Spirit reaching out to you saying, I want to love you and I want you to be part of my love outreach to the world. So today is a great day for you to accept the invitation to love Jesus. If anyone wants to stand as we close in prayer, please do stand with me. And if you're comfortable sitting, stay sitting. It's totally optional. But if there's anyone here who wants to pray, to refocus your love, you're a Christian, you want to refocus your love on God so that you can manifest these loves of church, of neighbor, and of enemy, then we're going to pray for that. And if there's anyone who's ready to turn and accept the love of God, the love of Jesus for the first time, we'll pray for that as well. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for all that you have done. Lord Jesus, you didn't just talk agapeo. You didn't just talk a self-sacrificial love. No, Jesus, you came and lived it out among us. And your witnesses wrote it down in our scripture so that we would have the full record of your love for us, acted out, lived out, and taken up to the cross. What a beautiful example it is that you've given us, Jesus. Thank you for us. And you've described in your word, Jesus, these loves. You've reminded us that our first love is for you, is for God, is for your Holy Spirit. And we understand, Jesus, that none of the other great high loves you've called us to are possible on our own. And none of the Jesus are possible if we don't focus on loving you first. So, Jesus, if we felt convicted by your spirit today that we're not loving as we should, help us to focus on loving you. Help us to take an inventory of where we spend our energy, where we spend our time, and let us reinvest in you so that we be your people of genuine and deep and meaningful love. And, Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here who is not a follower, who, is, who has heard your call to love, 
who is feeling it in their spirit. Lord Jesus, who is ready to respond, then I pray you would give them the strength in their spirit today to say these words to you, to say to you, Lord Jesus, today I am ready to make you my Lord and my Savior. I understand that you love me and you want to be in a relationship with me, that you gave yourself up so I don't have to be tied down by my past hurts or my past sins, that I can have new life. So Lord Jesus, renew me, I ask in your precious name. And everyone who agreed with these prayers, we invite you to say, Amen. Amen. Now if anyone would like to pray further, I'll be available at the front after, and I believe some of the church members as well. Uh, otherwise, this concludes our service for today. God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and grant you.